A very good afternoon to you all um, and welcome to this APM webinar. Um, I should, of course, be saying to you happy International Project Management Day, as that's what it is today. And that seems like a really good excuse to give some insights into project management, the project profession, and what better way to do that than by hearing from some project professionals based in different parts of the world. So um, as a scene set, my name is Casper Bartington. Uh, I work at the Association for Project Management, the Chartered Body for the Project Profession. Uh, and I'm joined by three special guests today, Marsha Dennis, who works at PA Consulting, um, Emil Fakhouri, um, who is based in Dubai and one of our Chartered Project Professionals, and uh, Chad Leger, uh, who is a fellow of the Association for Project Management um, and currently works for Jacobs. So before we start, I'm just going to explain the format of the session today. We will uh, do a very quick introduction from me um, about the profession. Um, then each of my special guests will present for about five minutes um, on their story so far. Um, we'll then take questions uh, and then we will move on um, or I'll move on to the, to the sort of last third of the session by talking about some practical next steps that students can take um, if they want to engage more with the project profession. Um, there are a couple of different ways uh, to engage with us. Um, you can uh, use the chat function uh, on here. You can pose a question to us. Um, and as you can see from the header slide, we're going to be running in the background a small number of questions on Slido. Um, the one that's open at the moment is, is just so that we know um, who you are, what your background is. Are you a student? Are you a project professional or something else? So if you can complete that, that will be great. Um, we will then ask another couple of questions as we go through. I'm just very simple ones, no need to write down too much. Um, and uh, yeah, there is time to ask questions. And if you can ask the questions in in the go to um, questions part rather than on Slido, that would be super helpful. Thank you. Um, so without any further ado, let's kick off the session. So. Uh, when I was thinking many months ago of doing this session, I, I thought I would be talking about this. I thought I'd be talking about you know, what an amazing Olympic Games it was in Tokyo uh, and some of the great project successes um, that flowed out of that. Now, uh, for those in the UK at least, um, we know that projects have rather turned out looking like this. Um, so some, some good examples of collaboration um, and innovation, just a rather sad backdrop um, to that. Now, if we think back to the happier story here, I'm pleased to say that one of our panelists will, will give a little bit of um, insight on her experience um, with regards to an Olympic Games. It's just not the Tokyo Olympic Games. So watch this space on that one. So, um, yeah, projects this year have looked a little bit different, um, whether that's you know making a new Nightingale Hospital in London or, of course, if you're a university student, you've got your degree being delivered in a rather different way uh, to what you were expecting. That took a lot of project-based work. So, so APM is the chartered body for the project profession. We've got 30-something thousand members around the world. <clears throat> We've got 500 plus corporate members as well. And one of the great things we can do is, is bring those people together to help you build your networks and your knowledge. So this is just a little example of, of, of the pan-sector nature of the project profession which is only going to become even more so as time goes by. I think it's fair to say that we've all realised that project-based working um, has been really helpful in making things happen a bit more quickly um, during this pandemic period. Um, and of course, we have those engagements, not just in construction and engineering, those project heartlands, but also in creative, in financial services, in consulting and, and in charities, just to name a few different examples. So one of the great things, I guess, for, for anybody thinking about the project profession is, is to be safe in the knowledge that there are only going to be more opportunities to work in projects moving forwards and every sector um, will work in a project based way so that you can end up aligning um, your career with, with what your interests are and what your values are. Um, so that's good news. Now, for those of you who don't know, last year we did a PM um, piece of research with PwC, one of our corporate members, about the size of the project profession. Um, I'm not going to talk about that in great detail because um, you can find this on our website, but I guess the key takeouts, at least with the UK focus, 
is the sheer importance of the profession, highly valuable to the UK economy, also employing a lot of people, not a completely mature profession yet. And I say that in a positive way because that means wonderful opportunities for people to come in and make a difference and build their career in the UK. But as we'll hear from some of our speakers, take some of those skill sets and experiences outside of the UK as well. So I expect that number of, of people in full time employment in project based roles only to grow um, over over the medium to long term and in fact in the short term, frankly. Um, but that tremendous value being brought to UK economies, one of the highest sectors, um, if you like, uh, in, in the UK economy period. Now, for those of you who don't know too much about project management, it might be easy to think I've got to have lots of subject matter expertise, lots of technical knowledge um, to be a successful project professional. That's often not the case. Um, and the number of people now who talk about people making projects is huge. So over the course of, of the sessions from our guest presenters, I think we'll be hearing a lot about things like uh, leadership skills, communication skills, organisational skills, as well as perhaps some technical expertise as well. But um, the key thing here is the project manager's role is to deliver on the vision to get the project delivered and to bring those subject matter experts with them. So uh, hence the, the image of the conductor, who they may not play with instruments very well, but they know how other people can do that to best effect. And that's some of what project professionals are all about. So I'm going to come back later on in this in this session today and talk about some of the practical steps that you can take, particularly as students, to get a bit closer to the profession, to find out about the roles that exist. But for now, I really want to hand over to the experts um, to talk about their experiences of, of working in projects so far. And, and my first expert today is, is Marsha Dennis. So, Marsha, would you like to uh, take the floor and pop your camera on, please? I think you're still on mute at the moment, Marsha. I still can't hear you, I'm afraid. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Brilliant. OK, sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, my name is Marsha Dennis. I have been working on project program management um, over 10 years. Um, I recently, well, not recently, I, I got into project program management just after I finished um, university where I did a marketing and business economics degree, which had nothing to do with uh, project management. And it was only when I went into the world of work um, that I stumbled upon project management. It was a, a new term for me when I worked for an organization called Grant Thornton. Um, there was an opportunity for me to do a, a PM type qualification, which was interesting and was um, part of my role in terms of managing teams, managing um, small scale projects. Um, and since taking that qualification at that time, which was just yeah, 20, I think it was 2007, um, I started to, to develop more in project program management in working in various industries after leaving Grant Thornton. I worked in other um, consultancy called Tribal Consulting, which allowed me to blend in some of my consultancy and project management experience. I then went on to, to work at the Olympics, which was my, my, um, my the way that I just um, started to, to propel into project program management. I was a senior project manager, managing over 21 planners, um, it was hectic. Um, it was it was great, but also challenging in terms of not just managing people, managing key stakeholders, managing suppliers, um, making sure that we was able to deliver a, a, a great game um, for for the UK, which took place in 2012. After working at the Olympics, I then went on to work for um, British Transport Police, working in their portfolio team. I also worked in um, other industries such as Ministry of Defence um, as a programme manager, managing a £1.1 billion programme, which was for their Better Estate programme. And then I went into uh, Ministry of Justice um, as a change delivery change lead, um, which encompassed some of the project programme with change management. 
um, to digitalise five different services across the UK um, for Ministry, Ministry of Justice. I then worked on um, Network Rail, um, number of project program um, programs such as Program Assurance. So looking at all of their current project programs, how they could be more innovative so that they can be brought up into the 21st century. And because of COVID, um, my experience have um, propelled in the last couple of weeks. I'm now working with uh, a number of councils, including um, and the health sector to look at how they can remodernize um, their current operating model so that they can then um, respond to future challenges um, such as COVID in the future. So as you can see, project program management doesn't have to be your typical looking at spreadsheets, looking at plans. Um, there are an opportunity to, to get into various types of um, aspects of project program management. So just by me explaining my career history, starting off being a senior project manager working at the Olympics, I now manage um, large complex transformation program using the experience that I had previously to manage multiple projects um, as, as I mentioned before, billion pound project programs and managing a transformation. So as you can see from my technical capabilities, um, I've included adaptive because that seems to be a new buzzword um, that is being used by the project profession to ensure that the operating model is flexible and project program managers are now starting to think about some of the skills that they can then adopt to make sure that an organisation becomes more adaptive for the 21st century. As you can see, I've mentioned transformation, project program delivery, change management, program turnaround. So these are some of the things that you can get involved in. And in terms of my qualification, I've got an MBA. I've also a full member, a membership of the um, APM, which has really helped in terms of engaging with the client, making sure that they can trust me in terms of managing a large program that I am dedicated to, to the profession. And that has helped me to work on other complex, challenging project programs. And as you can see below, you can see some of those sectors that I've worked in. So again, Network Rail, Ministry of Justice. I've also worked for British Transport Police, the Olympics, NHS, and Ministry of Defence. Casper, do you mind moving on to the next slide? So I just wanted to share some of my lessons learned. Um, it has been a bumpy road in the last 10 years in terms of understanding where I wanted to be in terms of my career in, in project program management. And I just wanted to share that information with you because when I joined, I didn't have um, you know, I didn't have, we had LinkedIn, we didn't have Instagram, we didn't have all of these social platforms where I was able to get in contact with people and just understand what my future can hold within Project Program. So I'd just like to just share some of that information so that you can then take away and think about how you want to develop as a, a Project Program Manager going forward. So one of the things I'll just want to take the first uh, left corner, so identify what you can offer. Um, so, so for me, some of the things that you can consider in terms of, you know, how do you want to become an effective project manager? So, you know, step aside from all of the technical terms um, that you probably see in textbooks. What do you want to do as a project manager so that you can be effective in your role? And how I'm effective in my role is by listening to my team listening beyond my team and really getting down to the operational level and understanding some of their challenges and their problems and then start thinking about how my project or program will impact them but also how I can bring them on board to make sure that I capture all of the key activity as part of my delivery to make sure that I deliver something that is expected and that's the way that you can provide benefits so that's one of the things that I consider for myself as being an effective project manager. There are a range of different leadership skills out there and it's worth just taking the time to think about what are the types of leadership skills that you want to adopt um, and start speaking to people who adopt those same um, leadership styles to understand how are they effective and what, what, what are the types of things that they consider 
when they are leading or making key decisions or developing a project program um, from scratch. There are a number of um, practices. So I've just listed some of these. So you've got your waterfall hybrid, you've got agile, and I mentioned that new term adaptive. And these are some of the things that you would need to consider as part of a, you know, as part of your team running a project. What are the practices you want to adopt? But also understand the various different types of practices that currently exist within other industries, so that you are aware. So when you are having conversations with your team or senior leaders, you can then say, okay, I'm going to use these practices as rather than all these other alternatives. And that way you can then gain buy-in um, as part of delivering your project or program. And one of the other things which is quite personal is just understanding your values. So what, what makes you tick? And how do you want to engage with your team? How do you want to engage with key stakeholders? So that you can start embedding some of those behaviours part of your project. Um, sometimes organisations have their ways of working which you may not like but you have the influence as a project manager to make those changes and it's just useful just to have those conversations really early on in your project so that you don't get yourself frustrated the team's not frustrated and the wider stakeholder group are not frustrated in terms of how you're operating so it's really good to have those conversations early on in terms of values and then that way you can then understand your own strengths and also your weaknesses and when i say weaknesses i'm not saying that you should say oh these are my weaknesses um I, I don't know how to address these think about your strengths first and think about how you can then incorporate collaborate with others to just strengthen it even further to bring out those values and i've been talking quite a bit more so i'm just going to just move on to network um, across many sectors um, again, this is really important and, and this is something that um, a lot of junior project managers always come to me and go, Marsha, you know, how, how can I build up my network? How do I know um, the different types of industries I want to go into? All I can say is speak to um, many people via LinkedIn. I, I do it all the time. Understand the different types of sectors people have worked in and understand all of the pros and the cons before you make a decision in terms of what industry you want to go into. Sometimes, you know, in terms of your values, going into a particular sector may not work for you and that takes time. So again, just speak to as many people, even if it's your colleagues, your family, your friends, even a network on, on this platform, speak to them and just get an understanding in terms of what is available for you because um, sometimes you can think, oh, I just want to go into the financial sector or just want to go into construction, where you can go into another sector that will provide you a lot more. So definitely explore all of the different options um, once you become a project program manager. And that kind of leads on to research and, and research far and wide. Um, there's loads of materials on the APM website. They do a lot of blogs. Um, there's a lot of information to help you understand the different types of project program management, where it can take you um, in terms of your career path, but also make sure that you document these information. Um, you know, no one's going to always going to guide you. So make sure you document it and just really think about, right, OK, I've done my network. I know the type of project program manager I want to be. Now I know that. I want to work in this particular sector and in that way you're then able to see what opportunities will open up for you in terms of develop and grow um, i've included things like um, finding a mentor i think finding a mentor is is key as soon as you start a, a project or program find someone who you can connect to even if it's someone senior, do not be scared to, to, you know, to speak to them and say, do you mind being my mentor or even a sponsor to say, you know, I know I'm at a junior level. I'll one day want to become a program manager or program director. You know, can you help me to build up those skills and the knowledge in order so that I can then, you know, meet those expectations. And that's something that I've done in, in every role that I've been in. Um, and that has helped me to then manage complex program ma management type roles. You know, don't, don't be afraid to, to speak up because at the end of the day, it's your career and it's up to you how you want to shape it. 
no one else is going to do that for you even if you feel that you don't have the the confidence or you could be a shy person or you feel that um you know you just don't know all of the key platforms that you would need to take in order to help you to excel into a senior leadership role speak to your mentors and your sponsor and they will always guide you and again you can always lean back to your network to make sure that you get all the information that you need so i hope that helps i don't know if i've got any questions that i can answer there, there's there's one question before <clears throat> before you head off marsha and that is um linda's asked how easy is it to move within and across sectors um you know based on your project management skills and experience as long as you're in the driving seat it's easy um but you need to make sure that you you speak to the right people and that's and hence why i said speak speak get in contact with people on linkedin um, so, so I made a move from working in industry, such as working in the NHS, the, you know, working on the Olympics, and then moving into consultancy. That wasn't very, that wasn't um, easy in a sense because sometimes con when you work in consultancy, they think, oh, you're coming from industry. We may need to start you at the bottom, but then you need to have that conversations to say, hold on a second, these are the skills that I can bring. Hence, I know I need to develop some other skills so make sure that you are aware of those skills that you need to develop and, and be be very frank to say i can bring all of these values to your organization and then that should help you to transition um, across industry or into consultancy brilliant thanks very much marcia um i'm gonna let you head off um and do your client you. work now but um appreciate okay. taking time out of your super busy day okay take care Bye bye So uh, our next guest um, is Emil Fakhoury, and Emil's going to um, walk you through his career, um, which, as you can see, encompasses a few different countries. So, uh, Emil, um, over to you, please. Thank you so much. So my name is Emil Fakhoury. I'm uh, originally from Lebanon. As you can see, I traveled to many places in my career, in my educational background. I, I want to take you briefly through it. So I give you a quick summary of who I am and how I I become, uh, uh, you know, in the in the project management profession. Uh, my background is mechanical engineering, and that helped me a lot to shape my career in the project pro profession. It's not necessary to have a, a technical or a engineering degree, but it helps you sometimes to know your product and, uh, you know, guide you through your career. I uh, lived a couple of years in France. Uh, I did my master's. I did the research work and development in France. Uh, this also helped me to stretch my comfort zone and develop my my capability on the personal and professional level uh, to, uh, you know, as Marsha said previously, you need to always work on your network. Um, then I moved back to Middle East. Uh, I have been there for uh, almost um, 15 years now. I moved through a couple of countries and it was all in the oil and gas and energy sector through uh, progressive career uh, positions. It started in uh, in project engineering and then moved on to project management with uh, uh, local and also international companies. In 2012, I got my first APM level uh, D degree, and the motivator was my company is Rolls Royce, who work in the aviation and the oil and gas sector at that time, and that triggered more my attention into the project management profession by itself, how to mainly resolve problems interact with clients and manage stakeholders, manage changes, communications. There is many uh, factors that triggered my attention into the profession. And progressively in the career, as you can see on the chart, I went to US. I did also configuration management. This is something different than project management, but it is also related. I continued since then into the into, into the career. I am back in Dubai uh, since 2016 where I still live now, and I did additional training, and with the help of APM, I was able to advance my career. You know, it also add, 
give you experiences, it gives you connection to the wide network of APM. I did my RPP in 2018. I was also uh, supported to move on to chartered status and fellow last year. So I'm very active with the APM. I uh, it's I spend some of, of the time during the week to attend webinars, uh, read books, opinions. There is a lot of uh, material you where you can enhance your career when it, it can guide you through online training also through many other material which you can find now very easily at this time where social media and access has become, become very easy. Kasper, can you move to the next slide, please? So what, what drives me to the project management profession, what I want to transfer to you also through my own experience, as I mentioned previously, I like dealing with people through various functions. And to do that, I find the project management profession is the right place to deal with engineering, with quality, with various function in the in the sector. It gives you a wider picture of what's happening in your business, in your organization, because you deal with external stakeholder and internal stakeholder. So you you can see outside your, your own project, you can see other colleagues how they do. And the trigger here, when you have a problem, don't stop on it, ask question, this will help you to learn and develop yourself. And uh, the way you go through the problem is shape, will shape your personality and career. You become more satisfied when you see uh, results happening and the, when you are able to balance, which is challenging for the profession, uh, to able to challenge both internal factor and external factor. Because you need in the project management to manage your cost, your budget, but at the same time, you want to have a happy customer, you want to deliver on time, and you want to please everyone. You are like, uh, you have more responsibility than authority. And that's what makes the, 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 the project profession challenging. It's not an easy, an easy profession. That's why you need to have the driver, the passion, that will help you move on through your career. And that's, that will help you also to, to satisfy yourself and develop your personality also, as I see it. Next slide, please, Casper. I wanted to share here some important event and link them together. That's what in every project you do, you need to always to think about the team and form the team. Sometimes you are deciding on your team, sometimes you inherit the team from uh, from your organization but the most important thing is to build the trust and the relationship because you cannot go far alone you need to have a team to help you push through the project what also help in the project is appreciation and this is not only at the end of the project it could should be done at different milestone you need to think about this, appreciate others and get appreciated. So this will motivate you in the dark time when you are in a difficulty when, or you have a problem. So you think about this moment and it will really boost you and help you. At the end of the project, as we all know, we will have a deadline to meet and realize the benefit. Keep in mind always the added value of your project because this will help you drive you and drive your team. What are you realizing? What is your contribution to your community or to your organization or to your, uh, your, your, your particular development also. Next slide, please. I think that's, that's all of that's my your slides. final slide. Yeah. So, yes, I, um, yeah. Thanks very much, Emil. Um, let, let's just go back to one of your previous slides here and, and pick up on a point that, that Marsha made. Um, we've had a question. Um, about mentors. Uh, I'm interested to know um, if you've had or, or have a mentor um, and what did you look for in that person? That's a question from Megan. Oh, very good. Good question. It's important to have a mentor. So I, I had different mentor in my different organization where I worked and you can choose a mentor inside your organization or outside it. I had both. Uh, you need to define what you need from your mentor to boost your career, to get advices, how to go through challenges, and how to manage the politics, which is already existing in many organizations. We cannot uh, run from it. So it's very important to choose a mentor uh, that is senior in the role, 
that has gone through this experience before you and that can give a little bit of time that you need to define. Don't leave everything to the mentor to do all the work for you. Try to define what you need in terms of time requirement and try to schedule a discussion every two months of every month. It, it could be short, it could be long, but don't uh, navigate in the organization world without having a mentor. Uh, this person will help you a lot and uh, we can rely on, you can uh, depend on, and uh, you can define the progression you want and you can use them as a resource to support you. I hope this answers the question. Lovely, thanks very much, Emil. Uh, right, I'm gonna turn to Chad now. So um, we'll come back to you later, Emil, for more questions. But um, Chad, um, over to you. Okay, hey, thank you. Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Chad Lajia. Um I work with a company called Jacobs. Um, I guess this first slide just really is to emphasize our our slogan, so to speak, and so far two key things that I keep at the front of my mind every day in project management is all about challenging today. Um, and not just accepting what we've done in the past in project management, but continue, continue thinking about how we can do it better. And the second really is about reinventing tomorrow. What will tomorrow look like? How can I change the profession? Um, and how how really can I provide leadership as we, we venture here? Uh, next slide, please, Castle. So about me, um, I've been with uh, Jacobs now for over 10 years. Um, I have about 20 years experience within the industry. Um, and some of the key things I wanted to kind of get across to you when I, I reflected on the topic, you know, where can projects take me? And if you kind of look at my career part there, I wanted to separate it into three key areas. Um, and either, or sorry, all of these can work for you within a project environment. You may decide two of which is applicable, three or even more. Um, so the first one and similar to Emil, I started off my career um, as an engineer. So I graduated with a degree in electrical and computer engineering. Um, I worked for a number of years doing um, project engineering and electrical engineering, designing substations, designing um, circuit breakers, designing uh, flows, um, how you create master cities, those sorts of things. And whilst I started to do that, it dawned on me that you know, part of what I was doing was not just not designing, but also leading the team through its implementation. And it's kind of got me interested and intrigued into the world of project management. Um, I then went on to do a master's in project management at the University of um, Manchester. And I started to get really start thinking about how I can make a difference in, in project management. And one of the things that led me to was an understanding of, well, I could, I knew the technical aspect, which was great. I knew the the project stuff, such as the Gantt charts, the planning, the financials, the budgets. Well, one of the other areas I kind of realized my 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 need for development was really just understanding the commercials of project management as well, because part of you know you you look at that cost quality triangle, and part of it was really understanding that cost and commercial part of it. So. That being said, I went back again to university and I did a, a master's degree in law to try and that really helped me get a better grip on construction law, so to speak. Um, so I kind of then moved in from technical engineering role into a project management role. And I worked for a number of years doing project management. And again, on reflection, part of me then said, okay, what next? And what I decided is there's, there's a subtle difference between project management and project leadership. Um, project management is all around the, the technical discipline of delivering that one output, um, whether it be um, uh, something for the client, um, you're working through your time, your budget, so those sorts of things that you're accustomed to. But project leadership for me was more about leading people, leading people through change, leading companies through change, um, and really leading the project profession rather than having my um, my hands involved in the day-to-day -day running of the project. So I kind of started to get involved again as my career progressed more into the project leadership, operational management side of it. Um, 
not until recently, again, I actually got involved into sales, into project. And, and that was actually a quite different and interesting route that I, I guess I never envisioned when I started my career. You know, whilst you, you do the hands-on delivery of projects, taking a step back and thinking about how you would set up a project um, before you even win it. How would you sell it? How would you bring your value proposition to the client? How would you bring your expertise and understanding of what you needed to do to really get the client to think, aha, uh -huh, this person understands how to deliver projects. So that's kind of what I've done over the, my career. I've kind of I've bucketed it here into three different sections. So that's the technical projects and the leadership and management. So just really for you to think about when you start to reflect on where projects can take you individually, it can be any one of these or all three or all another two or, or, or three if you wanted to add to it. Um, so there's no boundaries really on where your career can go in projects. Um, so that's the first slide there. Kathy, if you could just move on to the next slide. And secondly, to me, similar to Emil, I kind of wanted to, to have a different spin on it in terms of where projects can take you. Um, our first speaker obviously related to the different disciplines and industries and sectors that you can operate within. And I've been in the, I guess, real sector, transportation and aviation. I've worked in all those different sectors. But I kind of wanted to, to let you know, projects can also take you somewhere geographically. And this is kind of what got me involved in projects to start with. So I came from, I'm from the Caribbean. I did my, uh, my undergrad degree at the University of the West Indies. And a big part of my ambition at that point in time was to travel the world. Um, and sitting back at that point in time, I'm thinking, okay, how can I do so given the, my discipline and where I think my career will go? I, I thought that, you know, projects can actually help me see the world. So I started off in the Caribbean. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, Casper. So I started off in the Caribbean really doing electrical engineering um, and doing a lot of, I guess, as I said, high voltage system design, um, substation design, understanding circuit breaker, circuit switching, create, uh, creating of grid systems, how power flows, um, and managing teams as we started to invest in any of these big capital projects. I mean, some of these substations would be going into a couple of billions in terms of upgrading, redefining, and or rebuilding new grid systems. So that got me started here in the Caribbean. Um, next step, Casper. And after that, and after doing my, I guess my master's in, in project management and my master's in, in law, I wanted to do something differently. And um, what I did is I then got an opportunity to move to the Middle East. Um, you would see in the bottom left, it's a, it's a, basically, it's a reclaimed land. What this project was, it's the new Doha International Airport in Qatar. What the project did was actually reclaim all of this land from the sea, first of all, to start with, and then to build, when I got there, what was started as a three and a half billion um, pound project, which eventually turned out in 12, into 12 billion pounds. Um, but to really get involved in such a mega project of a a grand scale. Um, at that point in time, my career started to really take off, and I was actually responsible for construction of one of the terminals on the airport, and that really great, gave me a great in, insight into project management. I think my greatest lesson I learned from that point in time was culture and people. At that point, I worked with people from all over the globe. Um, I still have friends to date that, I mean, I've been to their weddings in Malaysia, et cetera. Um, having met them there in the Middle East and working on this project. Um, and it really opened up my eyes to working with people from different backgrounds, different understandings, different views of what time means insofar as the importance of time on a project, what the budget means, how much you can flex on the budget. Different cultures have different views on, you know, well, ah, inshallah, don't need to worry about it. It's okay, we can move on whilst you might have the client telling you, no, you can't do that. So it was a, a, good, a good learning experience for me um, from that perspective of managing projects in a, in a 
uh, what I would call a, a world setting, working with people from everywhere. Um, uh, next slide, Casper. And having done this, then I moved back to, or I moved to the UK. Um, and one of my first projects at that point in time was a project in Poland, which was, again, very interesting, um, not least because it it was very, very complicated and, and led to a lot of legal challenges, um, I, I should say. And, and this, in some ways, stayed to my strengths. You know, from this project came my strength of understanding commercial, understanding law, understanding the implications of what we built, understanding the tolerances within the projects to which we designed to, how that fits and how it was apl applicable to the given law um, at that point in time. Because obviously, we had designers based in the UK, designers based in Australia, designers based at our head office in, in Denver. and some of those designers were working to different standards, and I had to somehow be able to interpret that and bring it back to a um, legal understanding under the Polish law of what a design standard within a project would mean. Um, and for me, again, it, it, it wasn't a typical project activity in so far as the schedule cost, but it was more understanding the client expectations, um, what the client thought was good versus what we believed was good. Um, and unfortunately, as I said, it led, led to some legal challenges and legal um, appearances in court, which wasn't pleasant at that point in time, but I must say added a lot to my career in terms of my understanding of what we should and shouldn't do and things you do need to consider for future projects. You know, don't, don't disregard the details. Don't take it for granted that your design teams that are working for you as a project manager, that they understand the specifications they're going to use, simply because we're going to be using designers from all over the world, so they may all be working to a different standard. So that was an interesting part of my career. Um, and next slide, please, Casper. So after that, I kind of settled a bit more into the, the UK. Um, and if we start with the, the bottom row of photos there, my first real I guess project there was on Crossrail. Um, I was heavily involved uh, as the area business manager on what was known as the Connaught Tunnel. So basically, this was an old disused 1864 tunnel um, that, as part of the Crossrail program, commitments were made to regenerate the area. And part of the regeneration mean, meant we took this tunnel, 120 years disused and created it into a functional tunnel for Crossrail. And this was one of the most technically complex projects I've ever worked on. We couldn't widen the tunnel from within. And what we had to do, and what the second photo there at the bottom shows, is we actually had to drain. So on top of the tunnel was an entire, um, what's called the Victoria Docks. So this is right next to London City Airport. What we had to do was to drain the entire docks and basically build a tunnel from top down. So it was more or less an open box construction, open heart construction, we call it. And the complexities around doing something like that when you're right next to an airport, having cranes that are right up into the air and having cranes that might influence the flight path and dealing with you know, angry customers of London City Airport because the flight is canceled because a crane couldn't come down in time. We were having leakage through the um, through the copper dam whilst we were building it, and it, it really developed my understanding of trust in your team, trust in your designers, and more importantly, stakeholder management. I spent more time with my client, well, more time with the London City Airport and the residents than I actually did on site with my project team. And again, teaches you a different part of your career, um, but. Nonetheless, it's something very valuable. Then the middle set of photos there, it's all uh, around um, tube lines where I worked on as well. So this was basically creating some of the driverless trains we were doing on the, the Jubilee Northern Line upgrade program. Um, and this is really about creating trains that speak to each other through a big um, a network where they can understand which trains are speeding up, which trains are stopping, understand the stopping distances, and basically, use that feedback it's like this the driverless cars we have now so we were trying to create driverless trains and again introducing 
technology on such an archaic system has its own challenges and a, a very good learning point for me there. And last but not least, right now, I'm looking over a portfolio of projects in Dublin, even though I'm based in the UK, I'm really helping the client there understand their, um, their network flows and their passenger travel and their transport um, hot points. So in essence, I guess where I wanted to, to get to is projects can take you in multiple ways. You can either take you through different disciplines if you want to stay into the technical discipline, being part of the project, a project engineer, you can take you to the project management, be hands-on with the budget, the cost, or you could take you to the leadership where you really need to take a step above and your key driver there becomes your client's engagement, becomes your stakeholders. And then secondly, projects can take you anywhere in the world. Um, so far, I've been in the, the Middle East, I've worked in the US a bit, I've worked in um, the Caribbean, I've worked in the UK. Um, I'm hoping at some point in time I could either get to Africa or and to Australia because I need to take up all the continents. That's my goal for my career. Um, so I still have some time, I'm still young enough to get there. Um, but it's all really about what do you want to get out of your career and where do you want projects to take you personally? Brilliant, thanks very much for that, Chad. I've got a question that, from Taha that's really relevant to what you've just been talking about. And it's, how difficult was the transition between different roles in different countries? It was, and I'll give you an example. When I moved from, so I moved from uh, the Caribbean, I flew through the UK, spent a couple of um, months here before I went to the Middle East. And I remember showing up in, at, at the Middle East at the project site in the middle of the desert with a suit and a tie on because that's what I, I wore whilst I was in the UK um, working. And it was a big eye opener to me that here I was in the middle of a, a project and everyone could tell, huh, that's a newbie um, because it was a, a big culture shock for me. It was the first time I've ever been to the Middle East. Um, I hadn't known what to expect. Um, and I guess the good thing, one, I was open to that experience, um, but two, it's really learning from it um, and understanding and appreciating and more importantly, accepting that you're going to meet different cultures, there are different ways of doing things. There is no one right way to do something um, and therefore being open to the, that experience, I think has helped me a lot. Um, and not just being closed in my, that's my opinion of where I've come from and what I've seen as, as being normal, being, being willing to accept new things as the new norm. Brilliant, thanks very much uh, for that, Chad. Right, I'm gonna spend um, about three or four minutes um, talking about some practical next steps for the students on the call, and then there'll be a bit of time for questions for, for you and Emil. So um, let's move on. So. For those of you who are at university, um, one thing that professional bodies like APM can do is really bring you closer to the profession and student membership, which is free, can allow you to do that. And here are some of the benefits you can read for yourself. For me, a lot of it is about building knowledge and building networks. So things like our APM hub, um, you know, LinkedIn is very good as well, as Marsh has already said, having those events that are, are open for student members exclusively those kinds of things are, are well worth thinking about and you can just go to apm.org.uk to find out about how to become a student member um, uh, that'll take two minutes of your time something else that i think is going to be ever so important this year is employability um, and i think and a lot of employers think as well that a great complement to a degree um, is having a professional qualification so so these are our three key qualifications the project fundamentals one that you see on your left there it's actually now available as an online exam um, that you can take whenever you want. You might not look as happy as this when you're doing an hours exam, um, but um, when you get through it, you will find that the way that you're presenting yourself to an employer is going to be uh, more advantageous to you. You'll know the language of the sector, um, as well as having that academic knowledge and rigour that will make you a success in an organisation. So that's well worth thinking about. We are a chartered body and, and Emil is a walking example of a CHPP. Um, again, for those of you who are students or just starting in your career, I, I think it's never too early to, to look at what we're asking from you. So um, if you want these slides afterwards, then we can supply those. Take a look at the guidance and we'll 
let you know and show you what we expect from you. And the sooner you can start being strategic about that and sort of shaping your career, the quicker you can get there. And one of our upcoming webinars in a few weeks time is from Hazel, second from the right there, who was 25 when she became chartered. So it's not something that you need to have spent 20 years doing. It's about building the right amount of knowledge and experience. Now, during these uh, unusual times, it's never been more important to have webinars and access to knowledge in ways that suit you. So two things I wanted to flag for you were our free lunchtime webinars like this one. Um, if you miss any of them, um, our YouTube channel does have recordings. And for the student members or those of you who can be a student member, we've got these Emerging Professionals Network events, which are all about what it says on the slide there about learning from companies about their experiences of, for example, life under lockdown, and also building some of those new skills for the future. So we did a session last month on virtual presentation skills. A mixture of those things will really help you become more employable as well as more effective in your organization. And APM has these networks of branches, um, which still do events, even though they may not be face-to-face -face ones. Uh, and we've also got our specific interest groups as well. So if you know an aspect of the project profession you're interested in, these groups um, produce guides, have been very helpful in, in arranging webinars for us. And um, there will be some hopefully virtual conferences in, in the coming 12 months or so. But it's just a way for you to get a flavour of which aspects of project management might I be interested in. Uh, and that's a ready-made network of people for you to engage with. APM does research as well, whether that's kind of formal academic research around project leadership that, that a few of us have mentioned today, or the more informal research looking at the key global issues like projecting the future of climate change and aging population and so on, and, and what impact the project profession can play um, with regard to answering those questions. That's all available on our website. And just, just type in research. And in terms of the job market at the moment, it, it is uncertain not just in the UK but everywhere. Um, the graduate schemes for university students are opening a bit later in some cases um, than they normally do, so don't worry if you can't see the companies that you want. Um, they may not have opened yet. Um, those that have, we're promoting through our student membership um, emails, um, and for those of you who are already in profession, we've got our job site as well. So uh, there's plenty that we can offer. Um, these are the main points here about how to engage with us. Um, and before we go, in a few minutes, I will leave a slide up of some of the future webinars you might be interested in in, uh, in being involved with. But I, I did want to leave some time for um, a couple of other questions. So um, this is for both of you, um, Chad and Emil. It's a bit of an employability question, actually, from Callum. Um, uh, and he, he asks, how, have you found people are forthcoming when messaging someone you don't know on LinkedIn. So basically, you know, I'm a student, I want to build my network. How do I do that on LinkedIn? So can you give some examples of how what your approach would be or what, what approaches you've had? I'll start okay. with, with uh, Chad. Okay, thank you. Um, for me, yes, um, LinkedIn has been exploding for me. Um, I do get lots of requests for connections. Um, and I think it's important how you phrase your request for connection. Um, I think due to my job title, I was head of sales. People think that I'm responsible for all of Jacob sales. I get lots of um, folks thinking that they could sell stuff to me, to Jacobs. Um, so it, it is a bit, in a, I can be a bit overwhelmed with the amount of stuff I get daily uh, via LinkedIn. So I'd say if, if it is that you're reaching out for folks to get, get career guidance, you know, be a bit succinct in so far. Think of your words, what you're asking for. Um, because, yes, I think lots of folks are trying to use it, but you need to think about that key message. It's like the elevator, elevator pitch um, we have folks to develop. You know, you're not going to get senior professionals with more than a couple of minutes to listen to your elevator pitch. It's about within 30 seconds, really, how can you sell yourself? Great, thank you. Emil, any thoughts? Yeah, so uh, for me, I would uh, I would advise 
simply before sending a message to connect or sending a direct message, do a little bit of homework about the organization, about uh, what uh, the company does, what added values they bring, uh, and then make your message customized. Basically, if they need, uh, if there's a job, or if there is a requirement, rather than sending a very blank message. The more specific you are, the more knowledgeable you are about what you're asking, you get better results. So my advice is do a little bit research, half an hour, don't go too much in detail, but know who are you talking with and what is his role and what the organization is doing. Maybe they want a new project, maybe they have a new requirement, maybe they're you know, celebrating an event. So the more you are specific, you get the, the better attention, in my opinion. Thanks. Thanks very much, both of you, for answering that question. Uh, I, I guess on a linked point, uh, and I'll chip in at the end of what you said. Um, Emma has asked, um, how how would you recommend building those relationships with stakeholders, given that we're in a COVID environment and there aren't any live events? What what would your personal approaches be? Uh, Emma, let's start. start with you. Oh, okay, I will start. So you mean to build the connection and the network? So That's right. start. Start with your, uh, you know, with your closed circle, and then you can enlarge the circle slowly, slowly. Don't go far in a different country or a maybe a different uh, city you don't know. I would suggest to start with uh, your close connection. In LinkedIn, you have second level, third level. So start with the second level by engaging with them and slowly slowly give a little bit patience and time to grow your circle with the time you will connect to more and more uh, but be smart in choosing your connection the number is not uh, the criteria the, the criteria is the quality what this connection can do for you and for your career you need to choose within your uh, let's say business or, or, or domain and also the area of interest so you should have common area of interest so you can connect better with the people so you need to be i would suggest smart at engaging with with your connection thanks chad um, so for me, I guess it's, it's two things. So first of all, for those of you who aren't students, um, the key really is finding your mentor within your um, organization and ask them to help pull you along. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, you need to go that extra step sometimes in volunteering to do stuff, um, to get known, to expand your network, um, just to let people know who you are. So for example, if you know there's a a meeting next week with a client to talk about something and yet you might not contribute or might be required to contribute but if you do volunteer your time now it might be on your own time but you do volunteer can i attend to just at least understand what the company is looking to do or the next phase or whatever it may be it starts to build your network a bit more so i guess that's from the perspective of being having those connections for those that are students um I really think it's about using your U USB and you need to somehow think, reflect what's your unique selling point from the colleague sat next to you and try to maybe research those who may have something similar and try to reach out to try and use those to help build your network. And um, for me, whilst I went to university and part of me, so, you know, I did my undergrad in electrical engineering and I was fine. Then I did a master's which was fine, but at that point in time, everyone was doing a master's. So my USP was kind of being diluted. So my next selling point was, you know what, let me go do law, because how many people out there do both engineering and law and do project management? So I kind of did that. And then what I did is I aligned myself with some lawyers who were doing litigation on projects that had gone wrong as a starting point. I also then started to more align myself to the commercial side of project management to say, listen, I have an experience in this. I, I'm a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Actually, you know what? You have this case going on. Can I not help with it? I'll do it on my own time if needed, um, but can I not help with it? So for me, it's really thinking about your USB and then thinking, how can you best reach out to those around you to express that um, such that it stands out? Thanks very much. And I guess it would be remiss of me not to talk about APM zone networks. So I think, you know, using the APM hub, if you're a member, becoming a member and getting onto that network, using the branch network, even though they may not be delivering live events, using the SIG network, 
and, and yeah, really reaching out through the, the things like the Emerging Professional Network events, if you're eligible, and building that peer network as, as well as building a senior network. Um, and those networks can grow with you and go with you throughout your career. So that's something that professional bodies are quite good at. Um, now, I, I'm going to um, draw on one last question here before I wrap the session up. Um, and, and it's... It, I would ask this, wouldn't I? But, but hey, I'm in charge. Um, so Nikita has asked how APMs helped you uh, with your career development. Let's start with you first, Chad. Okay, thank you. I think APM has helped me meet like-minded folks. Um, what, something I hadn't appreciated before I joined APM. Uh, well, you know, going back to my earlier point, I hadn't appreciated we had legal. Um, Pinson Masons, as, as an example, being part of the APM, and by being part of the APM, being through some of those uh, webinars and, and stuff, I've been able to make contacts with those that I didn't know were part of that APM um, society. So it's really helped me get my understanding of a broader um, context, and it's it, it's difficult because obviously having moved from different regions and different geographies, when you get a new geography, you really want to understand the landscape. And APM has helped me get to speak quickly with what does project management look like in the UK? Thanks, Stan. And uh, Emil, as a CHPP, what, what are your thoughts on, on supporting your career? You know, I, I would like to put some elements important. Um, I got the certification, as you mentioned, the chartered, and previously I got previous certification from APM. It helped me through uh, recognition, both internally in my organization and also with my client. There is many clients who, uh, who appreciate, uh, you know, APM recognition internationally. And uh, to be honest with you, in some certification, it, it helped me push my limits, work harder, collect uh, my information, uh, wisely uh, critics my issues, how to assess risk. So there are a lot of elements you learn from APM and help you do your job better. And also, most importantly, you widen your network. So I have many colleagues who are chartered and different parts of the world who I connect with through APM Hub or through LinkedIn. So uh, it helped me through pushing my limits, the boundary, and developing my network a lot. Fantastic. Thanks. That's a great way to end the session. So what I've done is I've left a couple of uh, our upcoming webinars on a slide for you. Um, you can just go to our event page if you want to attend those. They're all free to attend. Some of those are emerging professional network events as well. Um, we will be uploading the recording uh, onto our YouTube channel. So if you were late joining, um, then don't worry, you won't miss anything. Um, the questions that we didn't have time to answer today, and we'll be pushing those out to our speakers and, and sort of supplying you with answers to that as well. So um, on International Project Management Day, just thanks once again um, to Chad and Emil for giving up your valuable time um, and to Marsha as well. And thank you, uh, audience, for attending. Um, so enjoy the rest of your day. Have a good afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all.